Up next, we're going to talk about end-time prophecy with two brothers who are brothers. Brother Michael Diamond, who's been on the program before, and Brother Peter Diamond. And they are next with me on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. We have a fascinating program for you tonight. First of all, let me introduce Brother Michael Diamond. He's been on the program with me before. He's been a traditional Catholic Benedictine monk for more than 24 years, producer of many videos on the Catholic Church, prophecy, other subjects. His website is VaticanCatholic.com. It is the highest-ranked traditional Catholic website in the world. His YouTube channel has more than 30 million video views and hits. And among the channels that claim to be Catholic, they have the third highest total of the video views in the world. So let's say hello to Brother Michael Diamond. Michael, welcome back. Hi, George. Looking forward to this. So many things are going on. We need your advice. Brother Peter Diamond, of course, also has been a traditional Catholic Benedictine monk for 18 years, and he's written various books and produced many video documentaries dealing with prophecy, scripture, Catholicism, and theology. His videos, too, have been viewed by millions. Here's Peter Diamond on Coast to Coast. Hi, Peter. Hi, George. Good looking forward to this. Let us start with, and I I won't address these to anybody specifically, so you can both uh, chime in here. Let's talk about, if we can, prophecy, the book of Revelation. Can can you give us a, a highlight, a synopsis of the book of Revelation, which you know, as as the, the the end of the Bible, basically. Sure. Uh, the book of Revelation covers a variety of issues. It's a, a letter to the seven churches of Asia. But the points of the book of Revelation that I think are most relevant for our period come in chapter 13, chapter 17, and chapter 18. And those are chapters that deal, we believe, and many people who comment on the book of Revelation, with end times events. There are disputes about whether some of the previous chapters have more of an application to the period when our Lord came and the establishment of the Church. But when you're talking about Revelation chapter 13, you're dealing with the beast that's prophesied to come. And when you're talking about Revelation 17 and 18, you're, look, <coughs> excuse me, you're looking at different aspects of that beast. And when you get into the details of what's prophesied about that beast, And what we're seeing now, specifically with regard to what's happening in Rome, it's truly uh, stunning information. And we are totally convinced, and we believe anyone who is willing to listen to the case, that an overwhelming case can be made, that what's happening in Rome, and particularly with this Vatican II revolution, is the fulfillment of many of those prophecies. And we could talk about details of those Mm -hmm. in a variety of areas and particular passages do you think it's accurate prophecy? Absolutely. And, and one of the points we could discuss concerning Revelation 18.2 and prophecies about Babylon, we believe it's so persuasive and so specific that if a person is open to hearing the truth on this, not only does it prove what we're saying about how the Vatican II Church and what has happened in Rome in the past 50 years is the fulfillment of that prophecy, but it also proves the inspiration of Scripture. Um, And we could talk about the details of that now if you wanted to. Sure, go ahead. Um, One of the main features in the book of Revelation concerns mystery Babylon. And and it comes in Revelation chapter 17, where St. John describes this massive harlot of Babylon. Now, the image of a harlot is, right away, giving us an indication that this is a Mm counter-church. Because the church in Scripture and Catholic teaching is known as the Bride of Christ. And, And many verses and... Catholic teachings could be cited on that point. And so when you're dealing with this harlot, you're dealing with a false ecclesiastical structure. And even in the Old Testament, when God's people would fall into an an idolatrous cult or uh, give in to heresies of various kinds, they would be called a whore or a harlot. And so what we're presented with in Revelation 17 is a massive counterfeit ecclesiastical structure that arises in the last days. And on its forehead is the name Babylon. And so Babylon is intimately connected with the rise of this counter-church. And when you look in the New Testament, the only place that Babylon is defined is in 1 Peter 5.13, where St. Peter says that the church that is in Babylon, elected together with you, salutes you. And so he's identifying the location where he was when he wrote that first epistle as the location of Babylon. Now, historically, we know 
that he wrote that first epistle in Rome. Right. He was martyred in Rome with St. Paul under the reign of Nero from AD 64 to AD 67. And so he wrote First Peter from Rome, and he gave it the code name Babylon, as many scholars would concur and realize and acknowledge. And so that gives us a huge key to identify where these prophecies about Babylon will be fulfilled. Not only will they be fulfilled in Rome, but more specifically, it's incredible, in the exact spot in Rome where St. Peter is. Now, there is a tradition going back to the very early church, and it's well documented and attested, that St. Peter's Basilica, that incredible building... That's in gorgeous, Vatican, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing structure. That was built over the tomb of the Apostle St. Peter. Uh-huh. There's a high altar there um, marking the spot. And so there's an apostolic tradition going right back to the very headquarters of the church. There's this connection. And it's actually fitting because in Matthew 16, we read that Christ founded the church upon St. Peter. He said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You are a Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so that's the one true church Christ established, outside of which there is no salvation. And he built it upon Peter, but it also was fitting that the most prominent physical structure in that church would also be built over his body. And providentially, that's what happened when the Vatican, and St. Peter's Basilica in particular, was constructed on the exact spot of his grave. And this gets amazing because if you apply this definition of Babylon being the place where St. Peter is, that's Babylon. And you look at the prophecies about Babylon. And I always thought Babylon might have been a rack. I don't know why. but it... Well, in the Old Testament, the city mentioned in the Old Testament was in Iraq. Ah, but okay. New Testament Babylon is, is entirely different. It's, it has a different meaning and a different application. And it is the place where St. Peter is. And so when you start to apply this, that, well, Babylon's most precise location is where St. Peter is. It's in the Vatican. And then you look at what's prophesied to happen at that spot at the end of the world, it matches up to a T to what we're seeing in this Vatican II revolution. And uh, we could get into, for instance, Revelation 18.2, which prophesied that, that Babylon would fall, fall, and become the prison of every unclean bird, and the prison of every unclean and hated beast. Why did they talk, Michael and Peter, in, in parables like this, where it wasn't cut and dry, but we have to interpret what these mean. Okay, that's an interesting question. Well, Jesus said some of the things in parables so that those who were more discerning would be able to understand, but those who didn't really want the truth, who didn't exercise the level of diligence in searching it out, wouldn't be able to see, or they would mock it. Um, And when we're talking about the apocalypse, he doesn't make it totally obvious. It, It requires more thought, more discernment, more effort, because he wants to weed out the people who aren't interested in traveling the narrow path, as he says in Matthew 7.13. But what we're going to discuss here, I mean, provides a stunning fulfillment uh, of the prophecy for those who are open to what's going to be covered. Because as I said in Revelation 18.2, it says that Babylon will fall and become the prison of every unclean bird and every unclean beast. Now, people were probably puzzled. What could that mean? How could Babylon become the prison or the hold of every unclean bird and beast? Well, on December 8th, 2015, about a year ago, the Vatican held this light show called Fiat Lux, an unprecedented light show. Like, it was a laser show, wasn't oh, it? Oh, you're familiar with it, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and they, during this laser show, allegedly to uh, raise awareness for, quote, climate change, they projected onto the facade of St. Peter's Basilica every kind of bird and beast. There were images of tigers and monkeys <laughs> and lizards. It, it was lifted, basically, from the words of Revelation 18. Yeah, exactly. And where did it happen? It happened at St. Peter's Basilica, as I was saying before, the precise location of Babylon. So do you see that connection there? That well, scripture tells us infallibly in 1 Peter 5.13 that Babylon equals where St. Peter is. St. Peter was buried right in St. Peter's Basilica. So you, what you're saying, though, if, if, if I'm following this, is that we are in end times and these signs are obviously there. Oh, Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. We're in end times. We're deep into the end times. There are many things we could cover. And the, the, one of the key features of the end times is that his true church, the one church he established, as a punishment for the sins of the world in the final deception. He's going to allow the infrastructure, the real estate, the buildings of his true church to be overtaken by a counter-church. 
and they take control of the Vatican, they spread a new religion which contradicts what all the popes have taught. Oh, and if you just look at what Francis is teaching now, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. He teaches that it's grave sin to convert people to Catholicism, over and over again. That's what he says. He, he teaches that it's illicit to convert people to Catholicism. Now, every other pope would disagree with that, right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's the opposite, that there's an obligation to announce the message of the Church because it's necessary for salvation to be part of the Catholic Church. That's what the Church has taught. It's a dogma called, outside the Catholic Church, there's no salvation. He totally rejects that. This Vatican Jew religion has a new Mass, new sacraments, new catechism. It has new teachings on uh, who's in the Church. It has new teachings on what the Church thinks of non-Catholic religions. And it's a total revolutionary counter-Church, and what it is is the fulfillment of the prophecies about the Whore of Babylon. And that's why the very sign described here in Revelation 18.2 is happening in the Vatican in our time. And it gets even more specific, because in this verse, it says that Babylon has fallen and become the prison of every unclean bird and beast. The word there is fulake, it can mean prison. Well, when they show these images that you saw in, on St. Peter's Basilica and the sounds, and the, the pillars in front of St. Peter's Basilica look just like prison bars. So it looked exactly like the images of these animals ah, in good point. a cage. And, and so this is a sign. That event was just a symbol of the larger reality of what's happening in the Vatican during this Vatican II revolution. And, so, and it also shows that on December 8, 2015, that that specific prophecy was fulfilled. And it happened on the 50th anniversary of the ending of Vatican II. That wasn't an accident, because Vatican II was the council that initiated this revolution. And what people need to realize is that according to Catholic teaching, you can't hold authority in the Catholic Church if you depart from the Church's dogmas. See, when I, when I think of end times, I think of the Antichrist, wars, um, maybe a consolidation of Russia and China together, um, people, you know, disappearing, dying. Is that where we're headed? I, I believe that some of those things with regard to wars and, and physical chastisements play a role at the very end, but they're a minor feature. The main feature of the apocalyptic prophecies about the Antichrist, about the Whore of Babylon, deal with this counter-church. Because the most important thing in the world is the salvation of one's soul. And the church he established, that's, that's the most important thing to look to in the whole world. And so Satan's main effort is to mislead the people who are following the true church. And that's why, actually, in Revelation 18.4, two verses after the verse we've been discussing, it says about Babylon, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. It's saying that you need to leave this false ecclesiastical structure, this counter-church that has arisen in Rome since Vatican II. And with regard to the Antichrist, this is all tied in, because the, the prophecies about the beast are connected to the prophecies about Babylon. And... Um, they're also connected to what's written in Revelation 13, 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 is also a key passage about the Antichrist, most people would agree. And it says that he will sit in the temple of God. Well, a lot of people believe that that refers to or has to refer to a reconstructed Jewish temple. But that's just totally off. Not only does such a temple not exist, uh, but they tried to rebuild it back under Julian the Apostate. And there are documented uh, records from various church fathers and historians that uh, fireballs shot out of the area to prevent the reconstruction of this temple. Jeez. Yeah, and so it was the destruction of the temple in AD 70 was a sign that Judaism has been superseded by the church. That's why in Scripture we see the church described as the new Israel. And so the temple of God, actually, in 1 Corinthians 3 and, and other passages, is identified as the church of Jesus Christ. The church is the new temple. So any prophecy about the Antichrist sitting in the temple in 2 Thessalonians 2 has to pertain to the Antichrist sitting in a structure that belongs to the church. Now, will the Antichrist do some of the things that Revelation talks about? Will he, well, will he what, cause what this saying, mayhem? Well, what we're saying is that what Revelation talks about is that the beast is a beast that was and is not, but returns. And what that means is that the beast was the empire, the Roman Empire that persecuted the church during the days of St. John, okay. when the Apocalypse was written, when the Revelation was received. And so 
that was the beast. That was the beast empire. Daniel referred to beasts as empires, or empires as beasts. And so this uh, beast that is prophesied in Revelation is an empire that is, represents a new version of the pagan Roman Empire. Could that be us? That Art, would be uh, the European Union. Aha, uh-huh. okay. That's a political dimension. Which could collapse. Well, it, it hasn't. Not and yet. It's been here through the key portion of the Great Apostasy and the key aspect of these prophecies. And actually, we could get into detail because what we're pointing out is that the beast is a reconstitution of the pagan Roman Empire, and the European Union is an empire. It's the political dimension of the end times beast. The spiritual dimension is this revolutionary counter church in Rome. Okay? And it's prophesied that this end times beast will arise in connection with seven Roman kings. Well, the Vatican City State, you're probably familiar with that. That's the sovereign nation um, of the Vatican. Mm-hmm. Right. It's and, like its and, own country almost. Right. And there were seven kings of it, starting with Pope Pius XI in 1929. And it says that the beast is going to arise when five are fallen. Well, that takes you to the reign of John Paul II, and that's when the European Union rose, hmm. during, the, during the reign of the sixth king, when five were fallen. It also says the seventh king would reign for a short time. Benedict XVI resigned on February 11, 2013, after a short reign, compared to John Paul II. And when he resigned, Lightning struck the top of St. Peter's Basilica. I don't know if you... Uh, I, yeah, we saw that. I think it's on YouTube, isn't it? Oh, yeah, and and it actually struck twice. It was strange. Well, yeah, and, and it was so um, amazing because the entire attention of the world was focused on the Vatican at that time. And many people commented, secular newspapers, is this some kind of sign from God? And our material gets into detail what it was. It, lightning actually struck the top of St. Peter's Basilica twice. And this is also connected to the prophecy of Revelation 18.2. Relatively soon, right, with each other? One oh, hit yeah, and then another? The lightning struck just a matter of hours after. After the first one. Yeah, when the whole world's attention was focused on the Vatican. So it wasn't some random It was strike. strange. And it was twice to eliminate any possible doubt or question of a coincidence. And what's interesting is that, as I was saying about Revelation 18.2, how it's fulfilled with precision at St. Peter's Basilica. This also happened at St. Peter's Basilica at Babylon. Well, in that verse, it says that Babylon is fallen, fallen. It says fallen twice. Notice that there were two lightning strikes at the top of St. Peter's Basilica. And what's interesting about this is that in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said that he saw Satan fall as lightning. The sign that Satan fell to a particular place was lightning. And in Revelation 18.2, we have two references to fallen. We have two lightning strikes at the top of St. Peter's Basilica. This is what it's referring to. Does does that mean Satan is back? That means that the Vatican is right now, under this Vatican II counter-church, the home of every demon, according to Revelation 18.2. And and we see what they're promoting. Uh, Francis recently came out with this document called Amoris Laetitia, which teaches that people are now free to get divorced, uh, quote, remarried, and go to communion. Contrary to what all the popes have taught, that marriage is indissoluble, still death, they now officially teach that you can get divorced or remarried and go to communion. All right, hold on, we're going to hit a break, but we'll come back as we talk about end times prophecy. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We have brothers Michael Diamond and Peter Diamond as we talk about end-time prophecies. Their websites, of course, are linked up to coasttocoastam.com, vaticancatholic.com. Several books and DVDs out on all the subjects uh, they've written about death, miracles, creation as well. Michael and Peter, the Antichrist, I've always thought the Antichrist was an individual, whether he or she is here now, I don't know, is that the case, or is that just a symbol of something? No, it is an individual, and that's one thing we can discuss. We believe that that individual was John Paul II, and we believe he f- clearly fulfills the prophecies about the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, in Revelation 13. What people need to realize is that the Antichrist is connected with the coming of the apostasy in Second Thessalonians 2. And what we've been discussing is the fulfillment of the apostasy, what has happened in Rome in the last 50 years. 
the Antichrist is also connected with the Whore of Babylon. That's why it's so important to understand what the real fulfillment of this prophecy about the Whore of Babylon is, because you can't separate the, the Antichrist and the Whore of Babylon. They come together. They're a package deal. And so the Antichrist comes as part of this great deception, and he will sit in the temple of God, showing that he himself is God. And we've produced a whole video and, and articles proving that John Paul II taught that every man is Jesus Christ. He taught that every man is God. He taught that the Son of God in his incarnation didn't just assume human nature, but he became everyone. He taught this over and over again in cyclical speeches so that everyone is the God-man. And this was, according to Pope St. Pius X, the distinguishing mark of Antichrist. And so he did this while hmm. sitting in the temple of God. And what people miss is that a big part of the prophecies about the Antichrist, and one that is explicitly mentioned in Revelation 13, is that his image is going to be venerated. Okay? He's going to be wounded. He's going to sit in the temple of God. He's going to proclaim that everyone is God. He's, and then he's going to have his image venerated. Well, we saw the, quote, canonization of John Paul II in 2014, which was the fulfillment of this prophecy, the veneration of a guy who taught that everyone is God, who, who taught that you shouldn't convert Protestants, who taught that um, all the false religions of the world are inspired by the Holy Spirit, who held this Assisi prayer event, which invited all the practitioners of the various false religions together to worship their false gods. And this is and was, in fact, a detailed fulfillment of what's also written in Second Thessalonians 2, because that it's, it says that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and he will oppose and raise himself above everything that is called God. And an actual alternate translation, a, a more literal translation, one could say of that, is that he will recline across from and raise himself above everything that is called God. Well, at this Assisi prayer meeting that John Paul II organized, it was world historic. Never before had all the people who worshipped various gods of the world been gathered in one place to, quote, worship. He organized it. And this represented a supreme blasphemy because this kind of activity was always condemned by the church. There's one true God. There's one true worship. The, uh, according to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10.20, the gods of the heathens are devils. And so they're worshipping devils. So he brought them all together. They all worshipped their various, quote, gods. And when he did this, he was elevated on a platform. He raised himself above every so-called god. And he was also across from where they were doing this. And this matches to a T what's written about him. And it just so happens that the same man was wounded on May 13, 1981, in, a, in an event that was also tied into this deception to build up his charisma. And then he had his image venerated. Hmm. Uh, in this quote, candidate. Now, well, now that he's gone, now that he's dead, I thought the Antichrist carried through the revelation. No, he doesn't necessarily have to. The, he, he simply has to be come at the time of the apostasy, which is near the time of the end. And in fact, a key component, as I've been saying, of the prophecies about the beast and the Antichrist is that his image will be venerated. Well, that can only happen in two possible ways during his life. Or, or, or after his or or after your his death. death. Yeah. And in fact, the word there, proskuneo in the Greek, that is the same word used for the veneration of images and saints. Uh, veneration of images of saints. Now, that's not idolatrous. The veneration of saints is, is Catholic. It's true. But in the end times, as part of this deception, this will be given, this veneration, to a man who's clearly not worthy of it, who brought in the worship all, of all the false gods, who claim to be God. And that's part of this deception. They call this guy a saint. When he did all of these things, they're so at odds with what the Church has always taught. And so what's so important about that also, and why it's so devastating to people not to venerate this person, is because that when you venerate John Paul II and say he's a saint, you're actually accepting false gods yourself because that's what he did. Yes, you're saying that someone can engage in that kind of behavior and be sanctified by it and be blessed by it. And that connects the person who does that with that false worship. See, my impression and, was he was a great pope. Am, am I wrong? You're, you're quite wrong, uh, because you have to measure things by the standard of Christ, his faith, his church. And according to the teaching of the church, to engage in, for instance, the activity that he conducted and organized at Assisi, where he invited all these people to worship their false gods, that's condemned as apostasy by Pope Pius XI in Mortalium Animos. It's always been condemned. 
it's false worship. It's an endorsement of idolatry. He, he led the charge for that. And this is also connected to the prophecies about the beast returning, because one of the things that um, happened in the pagan Roman Empire is that the pagan Roman kings had their image venerated and honored. And it also happened frequently after their deaths. Okay, that's what we see here. We see that not only John Paul II, but Paul VI, John the Twenty Third, these men who have brought in this spiritual revolution, now, guess what? They're being, quote, canonized. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy about the beast returning in a new form. And the spiritual component of that is what's happening in Rome now. The political component is what's happening with the European Union. This, this empire, this godless empire that doesn't even mention God in its constitution, despite the fact that it, it has taken over what was Catholic Europe, and so this is the real fulfillment of the prophecies, because he's going to sit in the temple of God. There's only one candidate for the temple of God, and that's the Vatican. That's St. Peter's Basilica. No other building could even uh, be, be a possible fulfillment of that. And that's why these prophecies are being fulfilled there. That's why all these revolutionary things have happened in the last 50 years. And when you get into uh, various other details about you know, the whore of Babylon and the seven kings, as I was mentioning, they clearly fit and are fulfilled by this arrival of the European Union. For instance, St. John describes this woman on a beast. Well, his description of this woman on the beast matches the description of the woman Europa in Greek mythology. It's like a picture of it. And the reason for that is that his prophecy about the beast and the whore and all of these things concerns what, what happens in Europe in the final days, politically and spiritually. And that's why we've seen with the rise of the European Union and this revolution in the Vatican, the paganization of Europe. It's, it's completely godless, basically, now. It, well, is, is there anything that, that we as people on this planet need to be concerned about in terms of how this will physically affect any of us? Well, what we would say is that the most important thing is that people need to recognize this information and embrace the true faith, the traditional Catholic faith, uh, which is necessary for salvation. That's the most important thing, because saving one's soul is the priority. But these prophecies uh, clearly concern what has happened here. And, for instance, it, it also talks about in Revelation 18.3 how all the world is drunk with the wine of her fornication. And it ref refers to wine numerous times. Well, the changes to the Mass involved a key change to the wine portion of the consecration after Vatican II. They changed the form of words for the wine. And that clearly invalidated the sacrament because it represented a massive alteration of the form that Jesus Christ delivered, that the Church had always used. And that's what it's referring to when it says the wine of her fornication. It says that this whore is clothed in purple and scarlet. Bishops wear purple, cardinals wear scarlet. She's clothed in the colors of the church church. The, the whore is not the Catholic church. It's this end times counter church and this structure uh, that has arisen when this counter church has taken control of the church's buildings. And, and that's why we see Francis doing the unbelievable things that he is doing. I mean, people have to ask themselves, what in the world is happening when he's saying to an atheist who's interviewing him, he won't even convert him, doesn't even want to convert him. I mean, this guy claims to be a Catholic pope. It's, it's absurd. All right, but where does the apocalypse come in? What I've been discussing about the fulfillment of the prophecies about the Horde of Babylon, we're living through it. It's, it. it's referring to this Vatican. Okay, well, this, this is what I don't get, because every person, uh, Peter and Michael, who have been on this program, they talk about horrendous things that are going to happen during end times, uh, you know, Half the planet gets wiped off, for example. You know, people die. I don't hear that coming from you. I think that in many cases, those interpretations are misplaced because they fail to see that the true nature of what's prophesied is a spiritual one. There will be such things just preceding the very second coming. And there, there have been major catastrophes, but the primary... Uh, message and the primary aspect of the prophecies is one that concerns what's happening to his church and his people. And that's uh, the group that was addressed in the apocalypse. It was addressed to the churches. 
and it's warning about you know being perverted by idolatry and false worship and heresy. Well, now let's talk about the second coming for a second. Um, my interpretation is is that uh, uh, Jesus is supposed to come back again. Is that do you see that? Absolutely. That's that's taught in Scripture. It's a dogma of the Church. He, he will come back again, and these are the signs that will precede his second coming, but there are passages that indicate that he'll come as a thief in the night. And so it's not going to be necessarily as people expect. Yeah. It will be as in the days of Noah. He says in Luke 18, 8, well, when the Son of Man returns, will he find any faith? And so there will be signs, and it, the things we've discussed are clear signs uh, of what's happening. And there, there are many others we could, we could get into. But they're only going to be obvious, many of these things, to people who are more discerning, who, who are looking with the eyes of faith, who care about what's most important. Otherwise, it's, it's, they're not going to recognize the significance because they don't understand the significance of uh, what Christ has left in his deposit in general. What about the rapture, where people just disappear? Is that going to happen? No, that refers to what happens when Christ comes. Um, First Thessalonians refers to it, when he comes again, the elect who are alive will be wrapped up with him at the event of the second coming. It does not refer to an event that's going to precede um, a period of tribulation, etc. That's a misunderstanding of the text, and really there's no biblical evidence for that at all. When he returns, will it be obvious? Oh yeah, every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, Revelation 1-7 says. And by the time he's back on earth, everyone who has ever lived, okay, everyone good or bad, will be raised. When the trumpet sounds, okay, the dead in Christ will rise, and then the, uh, the reprobate will rise as well. And so by the time he, he arrives back on earth, everyone who has ever lived is back. And so no, no one will miss that. But he's given us indications, and there are prophetic indications of what's going to happen, and the, one of the biggest ones is the apostasy. And that's what we're seeing right now. This is the apostasy. And if people can't see that when they look at the evidence of what's happening in Rome, I don't, I, I don't know what it would take to convince them. I mean, will, uh, will Rome collapse? The prophecies indicate that Babylon will be destroyed, thrown down. And what's very interesting about that is that the description of how Babylon is going to be destroyed match the descriptions of how the temples were destroyed. The same word is used, uh, desolation, desolate. And that's because Babylon, in the apocalyptic period, is the location of the end times temple. As we've been discussing, St. Peter's Basilica is where Babylon is. That's where we have this incredible building, uh, which is the temple of God. Pope Pius XI even officially called St. Peter's Basilica the temple in 1929. And the destruction of Babylon, as it's recorded in Apocalypse 18, matches the description Jesus gives in Matthew 23, 38, of how um, Jerusalem is being left desolate. And we know that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. The temple was thrown down. And so there's a parallel between the descriptions in Scripture of the destruction of Babylon and the destruction of the Old Testament temples, because Babylon is where the end times temple is. It's exactly what we've been discussing. The temple is in the Vatican, and in the end times, the temple has been overtaken by the church's enemies. Uh, the man of sin, the veneration of his image, this massive apostasy where they accept all the false religions, they say you can convert people, they've overturned what the church teaches or attempted to, they don't have any authority on marriage and all these other things. And people need to realize that the church teaches that such men who deny Catholic teaching are not valid popes and cannot be. There's um, a Catholic teaching that heretics cannot be popes. So the gates of hell have not prevailed. The Church still exists in a remnant of traditional Catholics, but it's been reduced to a remnant as this counter-church has taken control of the Church's building. Where does Satan fit in on this, Peter? Where, where, where does Satan fit? Well, it's the goal of Satan to get people to worship false gods, to give up their faith. And this is also connected to the third secret of Fatima, because in the third secret of Fatima, those who have known the contents of what is contained in the third secret of Fatima say that it deals only with our faith, a great crisis of faith, and something that will seemingly be internal. And so 
the things that we've been discussing are really the fulfillment of what's predicted in the third secret of Fatima, the attempted destruction of the faith, not by people starting a new church like Luther or Huss, but by people who claim to be Catholic infiltrating and taking over seemingly the positions of a power and authority in the church and creating a new kind of church, a pseudo-Catholicism, something that might resemble Catholicism in mm -hmm. some ways, but where the faith has been changed. And so when these people are accepting this new kind of religion that has emerged since Vatican II, they're not accepting Catholicism anymore. They're actually accepting a counterfeit Catholicism. W will they even know what it is? Well, they should know what it is, because the Vatican II religion has now embraced things that every person has a responsibility to know, such as the basics about what the Catholic Church teaches about its necessity, the falsity of other religions. I mean, you have a religion being promoted from the Vatican now that is complete religious indifferentism all the time. They're constantly praising Islamic leaders and saying they're fine. Uh, they teach that, as I mentioned, you can't convert people, you shouldn't convert people, it's not necessary. Uh, they teach that the Church includes people who deny her teachings, and that's the opposite of Catholic teaching. And so people have an obligation to be aware of the basic teachings of the Church, and if they make that minimal effort, they will see that what's being promoted now is a radical departure from what the Church has always taught. And he mentioned Fatima. Well, Sister Lucia told Father Fuentes in her famous interview with him that we are in the last times, that Our Lady of Fatima made her understand that we are in the last times. And so the prophecies about the beast and the whore and all of these things they are fulfilled in this period, okay? And according to Sister Lucia Fatima, and all the signs back that up. All right, the website, of course, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. Brothers Michael Diamond and Peter Diamond. It's a different uh, take on prophecy, to be sure, uh, because so many people who have been on this program talk about wars and famine and things like that. So when we come back in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM, I want your thoughts specifically on end times. And don't forget, we have uh, constantly sending out tweets, so follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. End time prophecies this time. End time prophecies. I want to know what you think. You've heard what the brothers think. Uh, I tend to think that there's going to be something else going on. Much like Stormberger says, something big could happen. Let's go to the phones. We'll pick it up by going to Jeff in Culver City, California, to get things started. Hey, Jeffrey. Hey, George, how you doing? And I'm sorry I missed the Mr. Diamond Brothers or whatever, but yes, George, uh, when it comes to the Antichrist and you know, all that, I just, out of you know, pure curiosity, wonder just exactly what the Antichrist powers were and how he, the Antichrist, would not only manifest in a physical or spiritual form, but how the Antichrist, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, uh, Beelzebub, and all that, you know, whatever name they call them throughout the centuries. I'm just curious as to how the Antichrist can give power to his minions and have them do his horrendous and devastating and horrific works. You know, now in 2017, you know, our time, 2017. Do you think the Antichrist is here, Jeff? Yes, yes, uh, I believe it, George. But, you know, George, since nothing... You know, has you know been really manifested so far. You know, Satan and his work you know, has, has been catastrophically uh, devastating in the world, and still continues to this day. You know, and I'm not talking about all the evil that has occurred in the last centuries, but I'm talking about now. You know, but my question is this, George: Do you think that even if there is no actual physical manifestation of a Jesus? Or, or another awaited savior, or a reincarnation of a, any other spiritual deity, whatever people believe. Do you think, George, that people would just say, "Okay, enough is enough with this," and just stop, and just just you know, just say, "Well, let me just live my life 
and then just die and go on. You know, I, I, which, I which, which could happen. What do you think of the, did you hear me with the Stormberger prophecies? What did you think of those? I, I, I believe the Stormberger prophecies have a lot of, um, uh, what do you call it, validation. Validation, you know? credence. Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very real, I, I believe it, George. Well, he talks about a third world war, and that's scary. And when you get that impression about all the things that are happening on this planet right now, man, anything anything could happen. Kevin in Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, Kev, welcome to the show. Hey, George, how are you? I'm good, Kevin. Thank you. Hope you are, too. Oh, wonderful. Now I'm talking to you again. Always a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what do you think? Author of, author of the Revelations, I... Uh, if you're going to speak revelations, you might want to talk about the author, and I didn't hear that. Uh, they claim it's John uh, from the island of Patmos, but he's a very mysterious individual, and I was curious as to whether or not within the realm of all of the people who talk about prophecy which you heard on your show, um, what, what do you take from uh, the author of this um, particular work? Well, he was, he was given the information, right? This is what everyone claims in terms of all of the books of the Bible, that, uh, that it's not just an individual, but it's been, you know, passed through as an agent and written down. Um, but we don't know very much about him, and a lot of people confuse him with, um, you know, John the Apostle. Well, i got to tell you, what if it's possible that uh, it was something entirely different? What if it was... A reincarnated Jesus or something that did that. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was thinking that if we have this Antichrist problem of identity, that perhaps maybe the Antichrist is, um, is a reincarnation uh, individual. That could be, too. That could be, too. End time prophecies in the time we have remaining here on Coast to Coast. Brenda's with us in uh, Notre Dame, Indiana. Hey, Brenda, welcome to the show. Hi. George, thank you for taking my call. You're a blessing. Me too. Thank you. You, uh, the two knuckleheads you had on last hour were blaspheming God left and right, and you were calling it, and they weren't even, they didn't even address what you were saying. First of all, the rock that, that is talked about in the Bible is the rock of Jesus Christ. It is not the Catholic Church. He built this, his, he built the church on himself. He is the Son of God. Second of all, there will be a temple built in Israel. They didn't even discuss that. The, the Antichrist will uh, perform the abomination of desolation in the temple that is being about to be rebuilt, even as we speak. They are already getting things ready for that temple. Mm -hmm. Third of all, you're asking them about the Antichrist. He is a real person. I believe he's on the planet right now. I don't think it was the Pope. No. The Pope is the false prophet. They were right about this, this Pope. He's, he's demonic. Lots of bad things going on there. The, the current Pope, you think? The current Pope, yes. He is, he's evil. He will be the right-hand man of the Antichrist. Oh, boy. There is a rapture. It is in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. He will take his real church, which is not the Catholic church, but the real ch church of God, of Jesus Christ, out. They will leave. There will be an, a battle of Armageddon. You were right on that. This, this man that you were quoting from 1830, yeah, he, he was more knowledgeable about what's happening than these two were. They, I'm sorry, but they didn't even have the courage to be on with you to take calls from people. Well, that's not, that's not their decision. Well, but I think you were right on the money, George. I listened to your show every night. You're a blessing. You had so many great Bible scholars on who are absolutely right on the money. And I just thank you for letting me be able to talk to you. And, and sometime I'd like for you to sing on the year for <laughs> Now you're pushing it, Brenda. <laughs> All right, thanks. Hey, by the way, we may have an event uh, near Indianapolis this year. you got to oh, come out there. Great. That would be great because I live in South Bend. I live about a mile from Notre Dame. So. Okay, cool. Thank you, George. All right, you got that. Yeah, the uh, prophecies. And look, and that's why we do this. I want you to call in. These are open lines, but on prophecies. I don't want to talk about much. We do that Friday night on Full Moon Friday, by the way. 
But I want you to address this with things that you've heard, things that you think. And, and I have been, since John Hogue, the expert on Nostradamus, told me about Stormberger, uh, I've been obsessed with his prophecies because here's a guy in the 1800s who talked about man will fly through the air like birds, cars without horses. Come on. What a visionary. But then when he starts talking about World War III, that scares the bejesus out of me. Dave in Sherman Oaks, California, west of the Rockies. Hi, David. Yes, hi, George. Thanks so much for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, originally, I thought the gentlemen were still going to be on, but I'll make a comment rather than ask the question. My comment is, I happen to have been raised a Presbyterian Protestant. Nevertheless, I have read far and wide. I'm a college graduate, graduate degrees. I've wondered why the Catholic Church in Rome is deemed the Antichrist Church. When you look at it, isn't it true that it's very possible that Iraq, Babylon, as you suggested to one of the guests, is actually the focal point of that? Why are we all looking at Europe? Why are we all looking at the Roman Catholic Church? I do agree that, yes, there was a revolution. Luther came along fought the Catholic Church, Protestantism developed. But, question, why is that the focal point? There's a lot of cities on Seven Hills. So the gentleman on, I'm thinking they're totally over-focused, a little bit too narrow-focused, and I'm wondering what you think about it. And, and, what do you think, good and what do you think of Iran, by the way, in this mix? Oh, wow. That's a toughie. I have the wild card. I, I do have a couple of thoughts. Here's one or two thoughts. Iran has been an incredible civilization over hundreds of years. The people of Iran are great people. The current, you know, political control in Iran since since 1979, give or take, is is wrong. And I'm not sure Trump should be opposing them to the degree he is. But Iran. Syria, Russia, all play in end-time prophecies. I've read extensively. I grant you that it's a difficult situation. Is Israel totally right in the Middle East? Not certain, but I know Iran is to be feared, and we need to we need to be careful with Iran. That that's for a fact. Yeah, I I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Tom, you've got a text for us. What do you have back there? Well, we do. We have a text in from Terrence in Idaho. George, tell me what you think. There are many problems in this world. Why is it that whenever something bad happens in the news, people cry that it's end times? Every civilization has thought that they were in end times. Mm -hmm. And not just ours. Every past civilization as well. All the ones in the past, they were wrong. Yes, they were wrong. Will we be wrong? Who knows? I don't know. That's so all, all I know is when you look at people that were prophetic, like a cow herder from the 1830s who predicted these things that have happened, and then he makes predictions, don't you have to assume that they're going to be right? <clears throat> Not always. Well, if you predicted things that happened, and, you know, and then they did, and then you predicted more, people would tend to believe you, wouldn't they? Yeah, but well, if you're really, really consistent, he seems to be. I mean, these things were said back in the 1830s. Well, look at Edgar Casey. Well, he was pretty he good too. This stuff, yeah. All right, let's go back to the phones. Blair in Sedona, Arizona. Hello, good friend. How are you? Hi, George. Well, I happened to see Pope John Paul II in 1982 at St. Peter's Square. A week before Christmas, he spoke in seven languages. Amazing. That was yeah. Yeah, a highlight of my life. I wanted to bring up an idea that the Antichrist is not a person, it's a principle. And it's been allowed to influence many people who have lived on Earth as sort of, um, well, as John, uh, the first epistle John, he says, many Antichrists have come. If people study the Bible, he says that. And he also says, if you deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is not of God, then this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which is coming and is now already on the world. 
already on the world. That was 2,000 years ago, George. So, like, a tell of a Han, Hitler, or obvious. I sort of think that the Antichrist is a principle that overshadows certain individuals from time to time as we live on this planet Earth. What do you think about that? I think that's pretty spot on. Uh, and the, the most important thing of all of this is... Where do you think we're headed? When when you look at prophecy from someone like this Stormberger guy, I keep bringing him up, but I mean it's uncanny. He's talking about a third world war. Do you think that's possible? Sure. I mean, he's similar to the uh, airplane prophecy of the Hopi that we're talking about here in Arizona a lot. The eight or nine prophecies of eight of nine have already come true. They talked about when... Um, Oh, uh, spider webs would crisscross the land. That was telegraph and telephone lines, you know, the the thunder that comes out. That That's was right. the uh, killing people, the guns and the, uh, the rivers of stones, interstate highways and stuff. So I think all kinds of spiritual people, not religious, but spiritual people all down through the ages come up with stuff like this. And Stormberger was tuned in. And they all come up with the same conclusion. That's the other part. They all see this major calamity, this major conflict, that maybe it is in our time. I th I'm going to have to do some mathematical arithmetic here, where he talks about uh, from the 1830s. This is, this is what he said. Somebody figure this out for me and send me an email. He said this in the 1830s. He said, my children won't experience it. He said that in the 1830s. You, my grandchildren, won't experience it, okay? So his kids' kids. But the third stock may easily experience it. So what does that mean? Add it together. Is that, uh, is that going to be us? Where's that time period? If somebody lives 80 years, what does that do? So his children, let's say, are born, and let's, let's give it 70 years. That's 1900 then, 1830 to 1900 and then their kids live an overlap of, let's say, another 50 years. That's 1950. And then uh, the next group. And he says, also the next group. Oh, man, we're right in it, aren't we? We're going to come back with more open lines in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you as we talk about end times prophecies, getting your thoughts on that. Where are we there? Let's go back to the phones. Ken in Tacoma, Washington, west of the Rockies. Good morning, Ken. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, good morning, George. So what do you think? Well, I wish the people that talk about Revelation would read the first verse. It, it says the revelation of God that he gave to Jesus Christ, and then he passed it on to John for his angel. But I've wanted, been trying to call you for a year. Wow. You, you've wanted to know where we are in Revelation. Yes. We are in the towards the end of the sixth vial period. And there's seven periods, right? Yeah, and the sixth vial period began in 1820. And at the end of the sixth vial period, Christ comes. And the sixth vial period talks about this, the end of the Ottoman Empire. God operates on the jubilee period of the, of the Jews. And the British took the land of Israel from the Ottoman Empire in 1917 because Christ can't return unless the Jews are in Israel. And that, the next... Uh, now, and that clock started in 1948, right? Well, well it started when they, when they got the land there and the Jews moved back. But then in 1967, was another, the next Jubilee year, they took the old Jerusalem... Right, there was that uh, the, that war. And that's the end of the time of the Gentiles. Well, this is a jubilee year, and I have an idea of what's going to happen this year. Just, well, tell me, tell me. Well, on the, <laughs> Ezekiel 38, where they talk about the invader from the north comes down on Israel to uh, people gathered from the nations that dwelling on the mountains of Israel. The Jews don't dwell on the mountains of Israel. Ninety percent of the mountains of Israel are the West Bank, which Palestine has. So I think this year the Jews are going to annex the West Bank, and that's going to raise all kinds of problems. All right, we'll, we'll look into that to be sure. We go next to Thomas in La Jolla, California. Hello, Thomas. 
Hi, George. Thank you for taking my call. Sure thing. And uh, I guess the guests are gone, so I will ask you, who is Archangel Michael, and what role does he play in end times? I know every year you play in wintertime the letter from Michael. Yeah, Christmas night. Yes. And uh, the letter from Michael is very inspiring, and if you go back World War One, World War Two, and obviously the Korean War, etc., many soldiers had um, felt that they were overshadowed by Archangel Michael. In the pre-Vatican II Catholicism, it seemed like Archangel Michael played a very big role, and in terms of services, etc., that are now deleted. And uh, so I was wondering if you would give, it seems, you know, Archangel Michael is considered the captain of the angelic host. And uh, so in terms of end times, well, you know, if there's ever an atomic war, I'd want Michael by my side for sure. Yeah, Michael's supposed to be the protector. And, uh, you know, that's evident in that uh, reading that we do on Christmas Eve and Christmas. Um, and... You know, in terms of uh, his pecking power as an angel, he's seen as a healing angel, but he's really seen as the protector, protector and the leader of the angels when it comes to battling evil. Interesting person that he might have been in his day. Huh? I wonder if he was ever a human. No, probably not. Huh? Yes, yes. Good question. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate your calling. And we go to Cornelius in Alexandria, Louisiana. Hello there, Cornelius. Yeah, Mr. Corny, as you call me there, Big George and old Tommy and all our callers and listeners, I was just telling Tommy I would hope that y'all would pray for the poor people in New Orleans. They got hit by a big tornado and stuff. And so oh, my gosh. Got yeah. killed. So thank the Lord for that. Yep. There's a whole lot of damage down there in New Orleans. Um, I, I just... I was amazed at some of this stuff, and like I said, you bring on these great guests. I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I wasn't going to, like the woman that said that they were, they're speaking some of the truth, and we need to listen to all of it. That's why I'm so glad you get all these uh, other people on. We get every view we can get. It, the only thing I didn't like was this. They didn't ask, answer anything about, which they weren't asked, but maybe next time you bring them on, you can ask them about the mark of the beast and stuff and what will happen with that. But I think some of that stuff is spot on and about Lucifer, the telescope that's in Arizona. And um, George, let me say my saying, and I'm going to get off so somebody else can get on. Get your God guns and gold and Bible bullets and beans and get ready. We're going to need it. We're going to need it. We've got Ken in the Highlands out there in Texas. Hey, Ken, good morning. Hi, how are you, George? Okay, thank you. First time caller. Good to have you with us. So what uh, what do you think about end times? Well, it's an uh, it's interesting program. I, d I didn't hear all of it. I just tuned in real late. All right. Well, it's but, good uh, to have you. I've studied Bible prophecy for over 40 years, George. Wow. And uh, You're a bigger I'm expert than me, like Kenny. You. Pardon me? You're a bigger expert on this than me, believe uh, me. Well, I don't know how much of an expert I am, but uh, I did write uh, when, uh, uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. August 2nd, uh, 1990, I did, uh, uh, you know, I had a lot of people at church ask me what was going on. I said, uh, actually, I didn't know. Uh, there was nothing in Bible prophecy that, standard Bible prophecy, that uh, anybody uh, saw coming right. on that. No, that's but, right. Uh, one week after he invaded, uh, it all started coming to me what was happening. So uh, uh, one week after he invaded, I started writing a book about that and about the uh, about the war that i thought would break out right after uh, the new year and i had that book published uh, in september of uh, 1990. what was that called it was uh, his story what in the world is happening could be read two ways it'd be uh, history uh, his story what in the bible what in the word is happening i'm sorry and uh, our history what in the uh, world is happening one was, uh, anyhow, uh, the book came out uh, in uh, January 16th of uh, 1991. 
on page 16, I had no control over where this fell, but on page 16, I had said we'd be in war shortly after the first year. So you made your own predictions. It, yeah, it it, uh, it got there. I was right on several things about that war, but I was also wrong. Um, I had believed it would be over on Passover of that very year. It's still going on. It was cut one month short. Uh, and uh, uh, then... then uh, uh, did did you interview. see the second Gulf War? Yeah. yeah. In the interview, uh, uh, a few months, or a couple of months after the war, uh, George Bush was, had uh, been asked, uh, how does this fit in with your uh, new world order? And uh, he said, we would like to have brought Iraq into the family of nations, but she wouldn't come in. And when he said that, a light bulb came on in, uh, in my head, and I remembered the scripture in the Old Testament, and Isaiah, I believe, if, I, if memory serves me right, which said uh, we would have healed Babylon, but she wouldn't be healed. Wow. So I began predicting good. the war would start up again, just like it left off. Are you predicting anything for beyond now? Well, uh, kind of. You know, I, I can't be sure about the year, but uh, it, uh, it'll happen around Passover. And I haven't even looked up to see what, when Passover is going to be this year. What kind of war, Kenny? Uh, it, this is going to be the worst war, George. It'll, it'll, uh, there'll be more people killed in this war than all the previous wars together. Oh, and it, the destruction is going to be from Israel to uh, 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 Iran and then uh, from Egypt all the way up into Russia. That whole region. That whole region. And the nuclear weapons are going to be used and the current Israel will be destroyed. And that's going to shock the world, uh, the Christian world, because it's being taught, a lot of books have been written, that that Israel is there to stay. Well, l listen that to Israel's Stormberger's prophecies about that. He, he says, uh, give me your take on this. He says, there will be weapons totally new. In one day, more men will die than in all previous wars. I believe it will be one day. Oh, gosh. And it, it will be one day. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> It, it uh, in uh, Ezekiel uh, 39, I believe it is, early on there, I forget what verse, around, around 6, uh, 6 or 7, uh, the verse, uh, it says, this is the day. This is the day. And it, uh, it'll be the day that, that uh, the world uh, sees a destruction in one day, less than 24 hours. See, that's what's scary, Ken, because people who are prophetic, like you, or this Stormberger guy in 1830, are all saying the same thing. Let's go to you, Tom, with a final text or tweet. I find that disturbing, what you just said, by the way, that yeah. more people will die in one day. One day. It's terrible. Uh, a text from Grace in Minneapolis. Do you think there are people that look forward to end times to be able to see their God? Now, that's an interesting question. Some people say the end of end times will be glorious, mm -hmm. will be perfect. I'm not so sure, because getting there isn't very nice. Are you afraid to die there? I know a lot of people that. No, I'm never afraid to die. Yeah. You know, you get the, uh, I'm, I, I'm just not, you know. I don't want to. Sure. Heck no, I don't want to check out early. I've got miles to go. i got got 100 years left on my contract here. Got to fulfill it. <laughs> but if somebody tells you it's glorious... And maybe you're not so scared? I'm not. Uh, look, I don't care about how many virgins are waiting for me at the end of the <laughs> rainbow. didn't say that. You know what? That's, to me, look, living is meant to live. Yeah. The best way you can. I'm choking. Keep talking. <laughs> Keep talking. You're right. Living is meant to live the best way you can. And I think that uh, if you don't, you're doing a disservice to yourself. But I also think there's a lot of people out there that lend credence to this question that they do look forward to end times and to dying to meet their creator. Well, I'm not. And I'm sure you're not either. Well, I want to be my creator, but I'm, I'm no rush. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. we got all the time I'm in the world. All right, we go to Perry in Santa Barbara, California. Hello, Perry. Welcome to the program. Hey, George, it's been a while. How are you? Man? I'm fine, Perry. I hope you are, too. Everything's well? Yeah, same here. Thank you. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Good. Um, you know, it's very interesting. Oh, by the way, can I do something really quick? Sure. That little gray cat, did you ever get it back when he was limping? He was fine. He stopped limping. 
He stayed out in the wild. He didn't want anything to do with coming inside of a house, <laughs> but he's okay. Oh, okay, good, good, George. But, you know, your guests are, were, uh, was it your decision to cut them off, or was it their decision that they do? I kind of wanted to do open lines, and, yeah. and I, yeah. I wasn't I, I, getting I them to answer right, me. It would have been very confrontational, you know, with, with them, yeah. with the audience. Well, you know, I'm Polish, and I'm Catholic, okay? I went through... Um, St. John the Baptist Catholic Church in, in Whiting, Indiana, and I went to Bishop Knoll Institute. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It was in Hammond, Indiana. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, prestigious. Uh, Very great. Prestigious school. Yeah. You know, I am really upset personally because I'm Polish. The way he talk, they talked about uh, Pope I'm John told. Paul II. All, all George, what, they, what Pope John Paul II meant is that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We have God in us. Well, we it, don't, I, I, I've got to say, I don't think the Pope was, is or was the Antichrist. No. No. He, um, all he meant was uh, that, uh, you know, we're right. We're all brothers and sisters in, in Christ, and, and uh, we're, we're his children, so God is within our own hearts. You got that right. Yeah. And uh, just the way he attacked the Catholic religion. Listen, if it wasn't for Vatican II, George, uh, the Catholic Church would really not have much of an influence nowadays. It was an attempt to modernize. And when I started school, uh, you know, Catholic uh, grade school and all that, um, yeah, it was starting, you know, Vatican II, you know. Well, you know, and the, the point is about divorce, for example, if you're mm -hmm. Catholic. And it, look, if marriages don't work, staying in it is worse. Yeah, because you'll destroy each other, you know? I yeah. mean, my grandmother uh, was divorced from my grandfather, my, you know, and uh, she was actually accepted back, you know? And so it's just, you know, just the Vatican II, George, was basically, uh, it's just a, a more of, of a humane, uh, more more sensitive church, and, and not the, uh, the the horror or, or right. whatever else your, your people said there. Exactly. I mean, your guests said. Okay, thanks, Perry. Well, Good to, have you, good to have you on the show. Uh, do we have time for another call? No, we are coming quickly to the end. Wow, what a fast hour this was. But uh, somebody email me and predict out the, those dates from Stormberger talking about World War III and when he thinks that was going to happen based on him uh, talking about his children, his grandchildren, and then the next generation after that. It's kind of, uh, kind of uncanny. Isn't it? And don't forget, of course, if you haven't signed up for the free Coast newsletter, you can do that at our website. And uh, spend some time at the website every day if you can, whether at work or, or wherever you might be. Just look at it and uh, take a look at it and uh, look at all the different things that are out there. We're going to do this again for you tomorrow, too. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDessour, Stephanie Smith, Chris Boros, and George Knapp. I'm George Norrie somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then.